So Joel, here we are on this beautiful Wednesday morning. And I just, as I was saying just a second ago, I'm so thankful to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you. And mostly that's because, um, well, there's lots of reasons for that. But the biggest reason is when I brought up the idea of having a conversation with you, I said it's on all these topics, <laughs> but I'm not really sure which one it's, you know, sort of about. And you're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. You sure, lead sure. all dance. And I think that is so, so generous. So I mentioned to you just a second ago that um, I've, I haven't interviewed anybody really or had an, a, a conversation recorded in a, like seven years basically eight years it's been a long time and it doesn't feel like this is sort of a resurrection of a podcast but more like an interest in having deep conversations with people who I respect and who challenge me um so it's not just like oh my god you have all the answers but man do you challenge people to find their own mm. so thank you for joining me in this con yesterday real quick Joel yesterday I was on a call with a guy who I met randomly on LinkedIn and I just thought his title, uh, Chief People Officer, was fascinating. I've heard that one a few times and I wanted to know, like, what does that even mean? And right from the outset of the conversation, the guy says to me, what exactly are we talking about here? And how do I know at the end of this conversation I'll have been successful? And I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> can we just breathe and connect, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. We actually, we actually have, a, have one of our stewards right now wonderful wonderful fellow uh but he, he's but he's intense he's so intense that that you find yourself kind of pulling away from him i mean you know he, he has he has his pad of paper he has his uh whatever his his britches with a pocket in him you know and he's got his little uh little spiral you know notepad and um and he, even in the most informal situation you know at at, at supper uh, if he sits next to you, he pulls out this notepad and said, so what are the, what are the three most important things you learned today? You, you know, and, and it's like, can we just, can we just enjoy each other? You know? And, and so anyway, I know exactly what you mean. There, there are, there are times for intensity when you really want to, man, let's, let's look at this. And there are times to enjoy each other. And, and, and uh, so, yeah, I'm 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 uh, I'm happy for all of those, but I get when you when you get into somebody that just can't like turn it off or dial it down, it's um it's <laughs> it's intense. It is, and I gotta be honest, dude. I'm I'm I've got some intensity in me, as I know you do. I do and, too. I and do I'm too. still learning how to dial it up and dial it down. It wasn't too hard for me to crank that intensity right up for him. I was like, but I just want to talk to you. Um, but it wasn't hard to get super like intelligent and, you know, like I can do that. That's my go-to. Yeah. I'm working on the other practice, which actually a part of our conversation today will be about this idea of docile. Uh, am I saying that word right? Um, yes. One docile. of the things you look for in your apprentice, uh, how many people do you have every year who, you know what, let me just back up a second, Joel, before you answer this question. I want to give a lead in an intro uh, for you, for those who are listening in who are like, Who's Joel? Well, everybody knows who Joel is, but who's, why is Misty interviewing Joel? Like, what is the, the point? What is, yeah. So let me just give our listeners, uh, maybe they're in the car or walking and listening, a little background on you and sort of why I care to get to know you. So Joel, you know, he's a, he's a co-founder of Polyface Farms down in, in Swoop, Virginia, which is in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It is gorgeous there. If you've never been, go and visit. Um, he was featured in Omnivore's Dilemma, which is not only a New York Times bestseller, but also an award-winning documentary. It's what led me into really wanting to get to know Joel a lot more, passion for me around um, the food industry. Uh, so Polyface Farms, it services 5,000 families of which we are one of them. And we're happy to pay a little extra for that peace of mind to know that the animals and the planet and all the people that supported the animals were well cared for. So Polyface Farm also serves uh, 50 services, 50 restaurants and 10 retail outlets and a farmer's market. They are no small potatoes in the world. They are a big deal for a lot of people. 
So those who like Joel, they call him the most famous farmer in the world, the high priest of the pasture, and the most eclectic thinker from Virginia since Thomas Jefferson. Those who do not like him call him a bioterrorist, a typhoid Mary, uh, uh, how do you say that word, Charl? Char charlatan. Charlatan, thank you. And a starvation advocate. So I just want to say I call Joel a friend. I call him a mentor. And frankly, in many ways, I call him a hero. That doesn't mean he's up on a box and never makes mistakes, but he is very heroic in his efforts and, um, and in his courage, which is why I've asked him to join me for this conversation, which today we're going to focus kind of on the intersection between community, belonging, connection, of course, food, the planet. We'll probably touch on mentorship and we will most assuredly talk about this word docile, which is an interesting term that I heard him use. I went and looked it up. Joel, my first question for you, just right out of the gate, like how many applicants do you get for this, for this apprenticeship program? Yeah, so so the, our we run a kind of a two part uh, uh, program here. The we call the first part the stewardship. The stewardship program runs May one to September thirty, and we have ten to eleven people in the stewardship program five months. Uh, you know, you can call it a boot camp, but but it's you know it's a foundational kind of introductory uh, immersion into the farm basically to find out our mission statement for that is is essentially we're not teaching you how to farm we're we're our mission statement is helping you to discover if you have the personality the passion uh the desire to 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 farm and um so you know that that takes a lot of pressure off if you're here to discover if you want to be a farmer than to come here and thinking we're going to make you a farmer. You know, that, that, that kind of takes a little bit of pressure off. And then at the midpoint of the uh, stewardship program, then you can apply to the, be an apprentice. And the apprentice then is 12 months beyond. So the uh, apprentice program goes October 15 to October 15. And so this year's apprentices were stewards last year. And so you have continuity. You know, they say you don't really learn something until you teach it. And so... Uh, and, and so this gives that little, and we take anywhere from two to four apprentices who then become the first level managers and teachers, if you will, of the next cycle of stewards. And during the winter, the winter interim, so the stewards leave September 30, the new apprentices come on October 15. And so from October 15 until the following May 1, before the next stewards come, those apprentices get an extremely intimate mentorship with, um, with the farm. Uh, Daniel, my son, goes through uh, extreme, extreme uh, ownership, the leadership book um, by the Navy SEALs. He goes through that leadership book with, the, you know, with the apprentices. And so we, you know, we, uh, we whatever, uh, massage them, okay, to take on this leadership role next year uh, with the, with the new stewards, so it's a you know it's a, it's a very formal program. We do formal lectures. We do uh, we we eat together um, uh, on on Monday through Friday. We we actually have a farm chef who cooks our meals for us. So there's there's 25 of us who live on the farm from the Salatin families all the way down to the to the children of staff members and and the, and, and and of course the stewards. So we we all eat together communally, and um, and. So we, so we take 10 or 11 of these every summer and then they, you know, they gradually develop. And so, some of the apprentices, uh, as they get ready to go, some of them want to stay. When we originally started the program, whatever, you know, 25, 26 years ago, uh, our goal was, you know, come learn and then, you know, go thou and do likewise, you know, kind of the discipleship thing. But as the farm has grown beyond our wildest expectations, we now uh, we now see it as a dual role. Yes, come learn and then go somewhere else and do your thing. But also, it's an incredible vetting a, a vetting procedure for us to find good fits and good people to join our team 
as 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 team as team members on our on our polyphase team. We get we get somewhere between 160 and 200 applicants uh, a year for those for those roughly 10 spots. So um, you know when people say how wonderful our stewards are, uh, we agree. Yes, but we also are quick to point out that this is the creme de la creme. I mean, you get 160, 170 applicants, and you take 10 of them. You know, you, you get to you get to be kind of choosy. And um, and as you know, uh, there's nothing like having the wrong team member, but there's also nothing like having the right team member. And so we we put a lot of uh, emphasis on that. So what is I, I've been to your farm a couple times, Joel. I love all the people. Is it so interesting because uh, two things happened the last time I was there. One, people kept I kept hearing people say, everybody who works here seems so happy, right? That was one thing I heard over and over again. And then the other one was uh, people thought I worked there. <laughs> you were happy. It was like, what's that? Because you were happy. I guess. I mean, it's, uh, I love you. I love the farm and I love to learn, you know, so it's not hard to be happy when you're at Polyface Farms. And there's just so many reasons to be happy, frankly. And uh, I just yeah. heard a recent quote, Joel, maybe you'll appreciate it. Uh, Brene Brown said, uh, she, she said, gratitude is not an attitude. It is a practice. And mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And it turns into an attitude, frankly, I would add that in there as well. But um, so one of the things I know, so that's a lot of people, we have 160 to 200 people coming in for 10 slots. And I know because I heard you, I overheard you because I sneak around and try to listen to everything you say. <laughs> Only I'm not terribly sneaky. I just pop my head and sit right next to you, right? Because um, I feel like I belong everywhere and uh, that I choose anyway. So I heard you talk about that, that you look for a docile. And I, I've actually heard you say that about the animals also that are on your land. You, you, you pick those animals based on that as well. Like, I don't think you grow bison for that reason. No, yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, we're, we're not into the, uh, we're not into the wild thing. So, uh, so yeah, so what we want um, is, is people that are, um, well, I, I guess the uh, the modern term would be that are that are chill. Okay, we 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 don't want people who have uh, temper issues, narcissistic issues, um, you know, those kinds of things that they get in the way of everything. And so we we need we need stability because you know on a farm, the weather changes. I mean, if there is one place where you where you just wake up in the morning and sometimes uh, there's a torrential rain. Well, you still gotta have to go out and do chores. You know, the, the chickens still have to be fed. And, and so, uh, so to be able to go into that um, stable and not upset, frustrated, angry, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a big deal. And so we actually, yeah, we actually picked uh, you know, one of our single, biggest uh, genetic traits for picking cows is uh, is docility you know we don't we don't need somebody to be attacked and killed by a cow um, and, and, and we don't want a cow that gets that has a high flight zone you know you, you walk up and all of a sudden her ears are up tails are up and she's you know heading to the uh, back end of the pasture and and, and uh, so we want people that exemplify that you know uh, hey I'm in I'm committed and um, Whatever comes along, I'm I'm your guy, I'm your gal, I'm your you know I'm I'm on the team, and um, whether I play, whether I don't play, you know that uh, that's a it's it, it's it's such a big deal. Have, have you always had that clarity, Joel, or did it, like you have an experience that that led you to that clarity? Uh, well, I think I think we've had that clarity for some time but sometimes you make a mistake <laughs> and you realize how important that is, you know? And so, so vetting actually uh, vetting these young people is a skill is a skill in and of itself, just like, you know, well, any skill. And so the Talk more about we, that a little bit, 
Talk about that a little bit. How do, how do you vet? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, so how we vet is, uh, so there are some, I'll call them just um, benchmarks or red flags, you know, so, so one is, uh, and these have developed over the years, Misty, we, we, we have not developed these, what I'll call kind of protocols um, in the first year, you know, that they, they develop as you, as you get more skilled. And so one is we have an extremely defined and narrow um, query time. I, I'm differentiating query from application. So, so August 1, August 1 to August 10 midnight, is query. In other words, that is when we have a special email open up on the website so that, and the, the website has the information that, all right, August 1, this special email is going to, you know, going to open up. In other words, it, it's all on the website, um, including the fact don't query us before August 1. You know, and so there are red flags. Like if somebody says, if somebody says, I know your website says don't query before August 1, but I'm just trying to get my name in the, I'm trying to get my name up front and center, you know, early to be, you know what? That just, that just excluded you. If you can't follow a simple instruction, like we're going to, we don't want to hear from you till August 1. Well, well then how do I know you're going to listen to me when I say go, you know, go move that cow over to that field or, or, or pick up. 100 chickens you're going to come back with 120 you know and so those are those are red flag benchmarks so what we've found is that by by formalizing by making making the the expectation more specific it it it, it excludes uh it, it it inherently excludes the people that are either are either not paying attention or are so whatever caught up with their own agenda that they can't conform to my agenda, and both of those are are bad. Um, one can be seen as as uh, eagerness to my agenda to the exclusion of everybody else's. The other one is just um, who cares, and and both of those extremes are are inappropriate. Uh, so we open this up August one to August ten. And yes, if you if you send an email one minute after midnight, August 10, oh, I just saw this. I didn't I, I, I didn't I didn't know that it was, you know, that the deadline was over. It's too late. Sorry. Next year. No exceptions. No exceptions. And uh, and, and that has really helped. So then when they query, then we send an application. It's a 10, it's a 10 question uh, application. And they, it, you know, just essay form. And they fill out answers to the questions, send them in, and then we all read them. Now, as you can imagine, uh, so we have four of us that initially read them, uh, Teresa and I, my wife and I, and then our son Daniel and his wife Sherry. We're the four Salatons. Um, and and um, so as you can imagine, you get in 160, 170, 180 uh, uh, applicants, applications, and um there's a lot of room there for tension among us. Okay, well, I like this one. I don't like that one. I like this. You can imagine the amount of bickering. So how in the world do we maintain family business harmony when you're having to pick 10 names out of 170? And so we, we have developed a very formal system where um, we, we each read independently and we have a prohibition on discussion. So I can't talk to Teresa. She can't talk to me. I can't talk to Daniel. We each read all of them and, and, and give them a green or red light. Okay. You know, yes or no. All right. Uh, and, and then, and, and we can't discuss it. Can't talk to each other. Why? Because if we did, if I talked to Teresa about, you know, Boy, that Amy, she's a she's a star. Before she reads it, now she's going to be prejudiced or, or you know biased to 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 take her. All right, and she might not see something that I missed in the you know in the in the answers. So so we 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 prohibit discussion. Then we all come together over uh, you know milk and milk and brownies or cookies or something. You know you <laughs> you yeah. add a little bit of fun to these things, and and we basically sit down 
we've got the stack. We have our we have our our, our rating sheet, and it's you know um, they're in alphabetical order. Uh, Amy, you know, yes, yes, no, no. Well, she goes on the two and two pile. We have five piles, all four yeses, three and one, two and two, one and three, and zero oh and four. Okay, five piles. If we get if we get four and zero, oh, four and zero. Oh, if we get enough of those, what we want we want to invite about 40, somewhere between 40 and 45 of the applicants to come to a two-day checkout at Polyface. They have to come here, they live with us, they eat with us, they work with us for two days, for two days. And, and so what we want is about a fourfold, we want to invite about four times as many as we want as we're going to pick so that we can you know, have, some, have some plenty of options. And so um, amazingly, amazingly, most of the time we get our full 4X complement 4 and 0. If we're a little bit short, then we go into the three and one stack. And, 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 and then, then there's discussion, then there's discussion. But as you can see, this procedure eliminates all discussion except for maybe two, three, five at the most names. That's it. So that way we don't shoot each other and we, we, you know, we can still survive in family harmony uh, because we have minimized the, 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 the selection, you know, um, the contesting, the, the contesting of the different ones in the selection process. So that has come over time, but, it, but now it's, um, you know, it, 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 works, it works really smooth, really great. So then they all come, they all come for the two day and we give, again, we give them a, a 10, uh, roughly a two week window to come for the two days. Now we'll go pick them up from the airport. You know, we'll, we'll, I mean, we, my goodness, we make, we make uh, three round trips to the airport sometimes in a day as this has, so this is a very, you know, we've got 40, whatever, 40 to 45 people here over two days, two weeks, they come and they go, they come and they go. We, we drop to two meals a day. So we eat wait, a wait, brunch. Wait. Are, are they being paid? No, no, they're not being paid. This, this is, this is a, this is, we call it a checkout. The checkout, because do, do, they're checking us out. Do any of them get paid out. along the way? I mean, when they, when they do become a, a formal. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, they do get paid. Uh, but but I'm, I'm just talking about the selection process yep, gotcha. right now. The selection process. So so um, so we you know we obviously so we've got these 160 180 people, 40 to 45 of them get picked for the two day checkout. They get this congratulatory, dear you know dear Amy, congratulations you've you've uh, you've crossed the first hurdle to becoming a polyface you know steward, um, and so here's the next step. Uh, we invite you to come to a two day checkout. Uh, November 30 to December 12, pick any two days in that period and, and come. We'll pick you up from the airport if you're going to fly, uh, but come and spend two days with us, working with us, living with us, eating with us for two days so you can find out what we're like, we can find out what you like, and this is the next step in the, in the, uh, the, the, the choosing process. So they all come, and so we have anywhere from, you know, from five to 12 uh, people you know, at any one day cycling through during this two week period. Again, well, it doesn't suit me to come then. Sorry, uh, you're out. No exceptions. No, we, had one, we had one guy from his dad, he was, uh, his family was stationed in South Korea. His dad was in the Air Force and he was facing exams um, and, and he flew the red eye. He flew the red eye from South Korea here, never went to bed, spent two days with us, flew the red eye back to take his exams, and we picked him. Uh, you know, you know, there's, there's, uh, you just, you just, um, you just have to make it work. You know, if you really want it, you have to be here. And so all of those things, what we've found is every time we start saying, well, yeah, we'll make an exception for you. We'll make an exception for you. What well, every time it's been a mistake, every time. No, you, you, you set what works for you and then, and then you, ex you, you expect other people to match up to it. And we found that if they really want it, they'll step up to the plate. I mean, goodness, of the queries, 30% uh, of the queries don't even bother to fill out the application. Oh, that's too hard. You know, 
So, 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 so we encourage people, it's okay. It's okay to put hurdles in front of choosing your team. A few hurdles in front of choosing your team is a good thing, is a good thing, uh, because you're going to get, you're going to get really good people. Gosh, Joel, as I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm thinking of the folks who are listening in, often of which are leaders, people in, in corporate and leaders. And one thing that comes to my mind is I can hear them almost saying, wow, that, that sounds really time consuming. I've got, you know, 500 people reporting to me or 100 people or 40 people reporting to me. I don't have time for all that. We just we just give the, the hiring to, I don't know, the, an, 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 a search firm or HR or whatever. I'm, but I'm also, as I'm listening, I know you and I imagine, t tell me a little bit of, is it a time sink or is it a time savings in the end? Um, you know, it's, it's a wash. I, I think it's a wash. Yes. Does it take time? It sure does. I mean, the, the most, the most arduous part of the process is reading all of the, um, all of the, the applications. Um, you know, it's it. Uh, I said one time, it's like read. It's like reading Moby Dick every year. You know, it's a massive stack of these things. Uh, that's the most arduous part. Daniel says, no, it's worse than reading Moby Dick. It's like reading Moby Dick with with the same chapter written by a different author over and over, <laughs> over again. <laughs> so, 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 so the most arduous part of the product pro, uh, of the of the thing is the hours that it takes to actually read through. Uh, we also, by the way, in the application now, we require a 30 second video. Uh, to, we, 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 pro, we pose one question, one question, and they have to answer it in, thir in they have 30 seconds uh, to answer it. And, um, and uh, I actually don't look at those because I'm not a video person, but Daniel and Sherry love that. I mean, they're, they're young, you know, they're the young people. And so, you know, video is where it's at, right? And so they get that. But, but ama amazingly, as we've gone to the little video clip, that has not changed our, our, uh, our harmony in who we, who we pick uh, among the four of us. Uh, so it, it, it's been, it's been a, a non-issue. Um, so, so, so they come for the checkout. Yeah, so it, yeah, yes, it, it, it is a huge investment for us. But remember, remember, we're picking we're picking the faces that are going to represent our brand for a year. For a year, if if that's not worth an investment, I don't know what is. Um, and, and so that's the way that's the way we view it. In, in fact, Teresa Teresa says this is like um, she says I like this. This is like ha being able to um, have more children without getting pregnant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and that's the way we view it. This is an intimate thing. I mean, we live together, we eat together, we work together. And so these are like, these are like children for, for Teresa and I, you know, and um, even though, you know, many of them are, are in their twenties, but we, we like them come, we like them come potty trained. And we like having kids that come potty trained. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it, it, it reduces the amount of stuff you got to teach them. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah. I got to ask you a quick question here. I just got to may I, may, I, may I challenge you for a moment? Sure. Uh, just sure. a few moments ago, you talked about the people who, you know, that they, they don't follow you, your protocols and maybe they try to get in early because for whatever reason. And to you, you're thinking, well, then you're not respecting my process. And my challenge with you on that one is some, some of us have been taught that if we look more eager and more ready and that we put ourselves forward um, uniquely, so to speak, then we stand a greater chance. I'll give you a quick example of this on LinkedIn, which I love. Um, I didn't know this, but I'm the only one that most people have experienced this with. There's a little feature on there for voice texting. And so mm -hmm. I just meet somebody, I link up with them. Um, like this guy, this chief people officer, I found him with his title and sent him a link request and he accepted. And I sent him a personalized message saying what a pleasure it is to meet him, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, nobody's ever done that before. And so it granted me the opportunity to interview uh -huh. him, to speak with him. Right. And I think some, in some ways, like that can be a sign of, of, uh, a, a hard worker or somebody who is, you know what I'm saying? Can you speak to that? 
Sure, I can. Well, what what if that guy on his LinkedIn? Uh, I, I don't I don't do LinkedIn, so I don't know all the procedures. But but imagine that if on his LinkedIn thing it said specifically, um, uh, please do not contact me via whatever this this video uh, link that you just used. Please do not con contact me by that. Uh, that is a sure way not to have me respond. Please respond this way. Would you have still done the video? No. And, and so, so we are very clear. We are very plain. Uh, we, are, we, we do not want to hear from you. We, we, we devote 10. Like you said, Misty, you know, this is a big investment for us. And we have carved out this period of time to, to deal with this. And we, we desperately want to hear from you this period of time, but we don't want to hear from you other time. Why? Because then we either, we either have to respond or, well, we feel like we should respond, then that takes extra amount of time. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's very specific uh, what, how, how we, procedurally, how we want them to respond. And we see it as just respecting our, our protocol, respecting our, our, our space and our protocol, um, you know, and, and so, Anyway, so yeah, that, that, that's my, and so you, you I can I think you confirm, there's a difference between having, having options. Um, you know, if, if we weren't specific about it and didn't, and didn't specifically deal with that question, then sure, you know, uh, e eager, eager beaver is great. We love eager beavers. And, and uh, interestingly, um, we have people who, who literally, you know, they've, they've watched this on the website. They've, they've been sitting on this for, you know, for five months. And as soon as it opens, you know, they query. I mean, the, the queries start pouring in, you know, literally one second after the, you know, the opening bell. And, um, and, and you know, uh, that's fine. And, and, if, and if it came, if it came right down to, to that nuance and it came down to an absolute tie, we would probably pick the person that was the first responder, not the one that came in right before the deadline, you know, at, at midnight, the, the final night. So, you know, there's, there's room to play with that. So Joel, why, why is it, I want to transition our conversation because I have a gazillion questions for you and you have beautiful answers that I'm sure people are listening to and taking notes. This is how we should create our onboarding uh, program. This is how, we, I mean, just, Every, everything that you shared there, I think, is gold and can be translated into any work environment. My next question for you has to do with this idea of gatherings. So in your events page, and even in our conversation while I was there, you, you talked about how you distinguish gatherings from events. And in fact, you talk on your website about why 300 people. And so I want to just ask you, why is that the sweet spot? And you talked about how it, it the reason for that part of that is so that people feel secure. I want to talk a little bit about that. And you use a lot of, your language is very intentional. Stewardship is a very intentional uh, language. It's all with the purpose of creating or looking for or distinguishing what it is specifically that people are doing or what it is that you're looking for. So I want to dive into this idea of gatherings versus the events and also this idea of how you are creating community within Polyface Farms and how do you how do you do that? There's I have a gazillion questions. I'm going to ask a couple of more real quick and we'll just play with all of them. You seem to be one of the people who attracts um, not just people who love food, but often those people who love food have gotten into the food industry for, for hard reasons. Maybe some of that is physical disease um, in the body. Some of that is uh, trauma from childhood. They seem to be like attracted to you and there seems to be healing that's happening there. So I'm curious about all of those things. Why are they attracted to you? Why, why is it that people at midnight are waiting to push the button. What is it about you and Polyface Farms that's causing that? And how does that connect up with belonging and gatherings and stewardship? There you go. 
Hey, good. I, well, you know, I thought I thought I was going to have one answer, but now as you went on, I realized I've got to start with a different answer. And I think I think my 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 initial thought to you, and, and again, we'll think through this together. Uh, but my initial thought to you is that people are are attracted to sacred sacred noble causes. Um, th there's an MIT professor. I can't think of his name right now, but he's one of these, you know futuristic kind of people and he says and he and he does you know uh uh future predictions and things and um he says he says that that in all of his interviews recently um he's found everyone you know liberal conservative uh you know wherever you are on, on the political religious ethnic whatever spectrum he said i found everybody i found consensus among three things everybody agrees on three things one is covid exposed the exposed the dysfunctionality of our system of our system in several areas and and and, and it showed that we're, we're heading the wrong way that that, that that it was it was it was like a wake up it was like a wake up call to the culture number two is everybody agrees i want to help fix it everybody wants to help fix it okay and number three is I don't know how, I don't know how to fix it. And so I'm just saying that to point out <clears throat> that, that when, that, that people generally want to, they want to help fix things, whether it's them personally or broader cultural things. Um, we, we generally want to fix, we want to help, we want to heal. And so at Polyface here, we have gone, we have gone to great lengths of, of drilling down to our soul, to our soul, to what gets us up in the morning, what actually makes, what actually makes a legacy life. Um, uh, what do we want on our tombstone? What do, what do we want? Um, what do what we want that? a world to, what okay. is that? So, yeah. So, uh, so our soul here at Polyface is healing. Uh, if you, if you look at our little, um, um, shopping bags they have our they have a little saying on the side healing the land one bite at a time so we're trying to connect we're trying to connect our greater ecosystem our, our ecological womb if you will we're trying to connect that with with what's on your plate so that you're you're eating now not mindlessly but you're actually you're actually engaging engaging your belief system your value system your perceptions you're engaging that intentionally on on practical decisions that you make through the day uh, the, the I'm, problem I'm, is i'm smiling yeah. so big right now joel because every every meal but certainly every evening every dinner when yvette my wife and i sit down to have dinner almost every meal has something polyface farms in it yeah. And I literally visualize what I have seen transpire oh, wow. in my mind. So I'm literally, I, when we were there and we saw the pigs, because we eat a lot of pork, um, yeah. we saw the pigs and they're happy. They're happy yeah. pigs and they're being moved from one place to the other. So they get to do what pigs are supposed to do. Yeah. And they're being yeah. cared for and tended to. Like I feel the love in, in that. I feel the care for, and I see the land. The land is vibrant. And, yeah. the, and I have a, a, lots of questions about, the vibrancy of your land too. So get 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 ready for those questions. I know it didn't yeah. start off vibrant. I know it started off like right. brown and yeah. over time. So I have many more questions. Please keep yeah. going. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So thank you. That that's very uh, gracious and kind. And, and so my point is here that that our mission statement. Here's our mission statement. It is to develop environmentally, emotionally and economically enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. That is, a you know, I, I've heard it said that if, if your mission statement be, can be accomplished in your lifetime, it's too small. Say it one more and, time. And that is, uh, Say right. it one more time. Yeah, okay, great, I will. And notice, notice I'm not reading it. I, 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 I know this, that. okay. So, yeah, so here it is. It's to develop environmentally, emotionally, and economically enhancing agricultural prototypes 
and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. How long did and it take so, you to come up with that? Come up with that? Um, how long did it take you? How long has that been in process? Uh, well, that's been our mission statement. Um, our very first mission statement was make a living on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> really simple. How do we make a living? I mean, that was Teresa and I's first one. But but as we started, you know, uh, getting some some traction and some fame, and people start coming looking at what we were doing and our models that we developed, uh, you know, your 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 vision can can expand with you. You know, it it, it grows with you. And so uh, so eventually, I don't know. We uh, we developed that one. I'm gonna say maybe. Uh, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's been with us for a long time and, and, and it has not changed and it is just our core, it is our, it is our soul. My point is that that is an incredibly attractive vision for somebody, for, for somebody who, who does want to help um, and, and doesn't know how. We're talking about prototypes, we're talking about the planet, we're talking about you know, both both personal and corporate, uh, you know, healing. And so why are people attracted here? I think it's because our, our vision, our objective, it's clear, it's measurable, it's precise. So people can wrap their heads around it. And it, it's ultimately, it's ultimately embraceive of, of everybody. I mean, <laughs> Who wants to destroy the planet? I mean, I suppose there are some people that want to do, but but I don't know anybody that wants to do that. We we do it we do it inadvertently. We do it in ignorance. We do it in 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 thoughtlessness. We don't do it intentionally. We we don't we don't destroy our bodies intentionally. Uh, we do it through ignorance, through negligence, through you know through all sorts of things. But nobody get nobody sets out at eighteen and says I want to die young. Or, or I want to be, you know, I want to have problems. Uh, nobody does that, and, and so, um, so we, we we view the best and we and we articulate it in a way that attracts people. And so, so obviously, part of that is emotional, emotional. Um, and so we we feel very strongly that we need a we need a place, we need a launch pad. Um, I mean, you can say it a million different ways, a launch pad, a germination tray, <laughs> you know, we need, we need a place here where that full spectrum of emotional, emotional attractiveness, um, in addition to the economic attractiveness, in addition to the ecological attractiveness, but the emotional attractiveness, you know, 80% of Americans hate their jobs, 80% of Americans hate their jobs. And so one of the things that we're big on is how do we create, how do we create uh, vocations that, that, that even at 70 years old, I can't wait to get up in the morning to participate in my vocation. You know, that's, that's a cool thing. And, and if, you can, if you can get something that's that meaningful, hopeful, helpful, and attractive, people naturally gravitate to it. They, you don't have to coerce them. They want to be here and be a part of it. And, and, and another thing too is that, that young people, I mean, obviously we're, you know, most of, our, most of our folks are young people. Interestingly, I'll tell you this, Mr. Interestingly, in the last uh, 15 years, we've watched a move from real young people, like 18, 19 year olds, to over half of our stewards are now late twenties and early thirties. Yeah, I noticed they are, that. They are young professionals. I noticed yeah, that. Why they are young that? professionals. Yeah. All right. Well, the, 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 what we see in the in the applications as to why you know why do you want to come? Uh, what we see is is burnout. We see. Yeah, I got my master's degree. I got my education. I'm sitting here in this Dilbert cubicle at the end of an expressway, punching numbers into cyberspace, and and I, I'm wishing I was I was the the guy down on the zero turn mower mowing the corporate headquarters lawn, you know, or or wondering I wonder if we could grow squash and watermelons out there on on the lawn, you know, and 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 people just start daydreaming, uh, 
uh, and, and and they're they're facing they're facing burnout. So here we are, this you know techno sophisticated clever culture. We can't figure out how to engage a person for more than five to ten years down a career track that they want to continue. And I I do think I do think one other point on this. I do think that some of this has been created because smart people in our culture, smart people have been have been channeled through our uh, our our guidance counselors, our school systems. They've been channeled out of um, out of manual. I'm just going to say manual vocations. So so you, you, when's the last time you heard an up a, a rising senior go in for say her last uh her last uh um you know guidance counselor her curriculum interview um and the guidance counselor looks at her grade says wow i don't know why i'm stuck on amy but anyway wow <laughs> amy <laughs> uh, you've got you've got fantastic grades you're really smart uh, you should be a farmer have you ever considered that you, nobody does that right and, and and so so a lot of these young people come to us and they just they were they were smart they were academic and and so they just got they just got, you know, uh, um, they just got channeled into this this academic corporate track, and nobody ever asked them what they dreamed about. The, uh, Misty, I think I think that we adults come into adulthood brain damaged. We grow up, we want to please mom. <laughs> you know, we want to please mom and dad. We want to please mom and dad. Then we want to please the teacher. Then we want to please the principal. Then we want to please the guidance counselor. Then we want to please the employer. We want to please the professor. We want to, and we come into our 20s and all we've done in life is please somebody else. And we've never looked in the mirror and said, who am I? What, what, what floats my boat? I mean, I, I get teary about this because I run into this all the time. And, and the young people we have here, they just did what, Mom and dad thought we're right. They did what the guidance counselor thought were right. You know, they're good in math. So the teacher says, hey, have you thought about a, a career in engineering? You know, I mean, they just go down this path and, and, and they've never, they've never actually taken the time to say, if money and time were not an issue, what would I do even if I didn't get paid for it? If I could live and not and, and 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 I didn't have to worry about a paycheck. Let's say somebody's taking care of me, and I could just do it. What would I do? And we find that nobody. I haven't run into anybody that says, "Well, I'd like to sit on my butt." You know, no, we we you know we love to do things. We're not lazy. the The problem is to take our latent, whatever uh, dreams, and 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 channel them into what's really us. And not somebody else's dream, not somebody else's fantasy, and um, and it's a that's a hard nut to crack. Mm -hmm. Joe, I love this conversation because as you talked about this whole pleasing everybody, my I am definitely guilty of this. And as you choked up with tears, I, I actually did too because I will never forget the day when. You know, I, I, I dealt with a lot of loss in my family and basically the loss came as a result of a lifting of denial. And once you're aware of some of the things that are happening to the children in your family and then therefore probably what happened to you that maybe mm -hmm. you were too, um, it was too traumatizing to really remember, uh, then there's a, there's a commitment um, to, to having and treating yourself with a great deal more kindness and not tolerating that. And so a lot of loss and I was at my front door and I was screaming at Yvette, I don't even know what I was yelling at her. And then I <laughs> slammed the door and I went for a walk and I came back, I came back in and there wasn't like a typical fight at all. It was just me yelling at her <laughs> for no reason. And I asked her, you know, what did I say to you? She goes, you screamed out, I don't know who I am. And, uh, and that was sobering oh. for me. I didn't know who I am and I'm still learning who I am I think it's going to be a lifelong journey for me uh, because you know I spent my whole life other people telling me what I was that wasn't so good and so trying to figure out a way to be somebody 
and then therefore somehow have value or worth in the world. I'm still very intertwined with what I do means that I'm valuable. This interview is one of the first ones I've done where it's not about, let me interview him so I can show the world that I can interview people, right? Or right. That, I, that I'm somebody because I know Joel or I'm somebody because I have great communication skills or I'm somebody because I can write a book or I'm somebody, because, but I am just on the cusp of what you just said, which is learning how to please myself. It comes with so much discomfort to do that. One of the things I learned um, when I was with you Sina, uh, what's her last name? Dr. Sina McClola? Sina McCullough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she told her story and I, I relate a lot to her story, a lot uh, of similarities there. But when she talked about looking in the mirror and saying, I love you, and she had us hold the phone up in front of our faces with it turned off, I mean, with it turned on um, airplane mode, but you can see yourself. Yeah. I had yeah. tried that a few times, a handful of times, never very comfortable. Well, every day since then, I'm like, if she had to do that to get to where she is, which is a tremendous place of healing. I'm, right. I'm going to fucking stand in front of the mirror and I'm going to talk to myself. And every yeah. day since I left Polyface, what about eight weeks ago? Uh -huh. Six to eight weeks ago, uh -huh. twice a day. <laughs> go wow. big or go home, right? <laughs> so how's, that, how's that been for you? How's it been? I mean, have you, is it I've good? Had, I've had a couple of, first of all, it's uncomfortable still. Yeah. It's less uncomfortable though. I'm starting to see myself in the mirror. This morning I leaned in for the first time. And I'm, what I noticed in my leaning in was a lot of judgment. So like, oh my gosh, my eyes look black. I have some troubles with insomnia, um, some troubles with sleep that I'm working through and have been for 25 years. Um, maybe uh -huh. one day it'll let go. It has a lot to do with trauma and childhood and not feeling safe. And so there's that's being mm -hmm. created. I just have put my hands in the in the in a power that be that's much greater than me. And so I know it's being worked out and there's nothing for me to do. But I just I noticed the judgment and and I didn't judge the judgment, which is new for me. But I noticed, the oh, my gosh, I've got some wrinkles going on here, you know, and I'm like, so I smiled bigger. Uh, and I just kept saying, I love you, Misty, exactly as you are, which was the word she gave. And then God gave me the words. Um, Thank you. Uh -huh. And then God gave me the words, I've got you. Uh, so those are the words I say every day, twice a day. And sometimes I'll catch myself in the mirror. It's a practice though. It's not, it doesn't like come to me and like, it's easy and I can yeah, do yeah. it. No, but if she could do that and she, and she talked about it on your stage, mm -hmm. then you probably also believe in what she's doing. And I have so much respect for what you do, Joel. Like I remember when I was watching the omnivores dilemma, and other things that you've been a part of. I remember the story that you told about how the government was trying to, I'm gonna butcher this, so forgive me, but how the government was trying to tell you how you could butcher your, your, yeah. um, your chickens, right? And ultimately you paid a lot of money to have research done so that you could show that your process was actually healthier. So you had to fight for that. And that was a big fight for something that was so obviously right. But you had to fight and you've had to fight a lot in a world that is trying to just make things better, faster, better, faster. And you've been criticized and ridiculed many times. So and you continue to show up and be a steward of the planet, of people, of the the stories that you tell aren't perfect stories. They're not about how perfect you are. The stories you and sometimes you tell stories that make me laugh hilariously uh, with you, but towards you, because <laughs> you do goofy stuff too. And you know, sure. so sure, sure. So so um, as you were as you were describing all that, it, it struck me the difference between between trying to prove yourself prove yourself to yourself and to others. The difference between, I've got to get up this morning, I've got to prove myself. I've got to prove my worth. I've got to prove my value. I've got to prove my talent versus all, all that kind of uh, under that umbrella of proving. And I'm brainstorming here, Misty. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just, I'm just brainstorming here with you, uh, enjoying the conversation. Um, so in that, the difference between proving and, and uh, um, I don't know what would be the uh, the opposite uh, progressing maybe progressing toward toward 
a goal that's out there that's bigger than me that that's noble that's righteous that's that that that's 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 sacred um and, and that and if i'm if i'm making progress toward that that noble whatever uh uh place of 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 sacredness of goodness um I don't have to prove myself so much. I, I, one's kind of negative. Negative is oh, I'm not good enough. I got to prove myself. The other one's very positive. Whoever I am, whatever I am, whoever I am, I'm heading toward this goal, this objective. I'm heading toward this objective. And that's ultimately very positive. If I get there, fine. If I don't get there, fine. If I get there fast, fine. If I get there slow, fine. I heard one guy that I uh, really respect said, um, don't worry about your speed. Worry about Worry about your trajectory. In other words, in other words, um, you know, in, in the in the Aesop fable, you know, the, the 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 tortoise won the race. The rabbit didn't. And and so many times we have this goal out here, and we're frustrated because we're not getting there as fast as we'd like. But actually, it, it's not the speed. It's it's the are we are we making progress are we getting there are we making progress toward that and that's actually quite good enough and i find that that for us in business for for us in business for example we don't have a sales target we, we don't have um we have these 10 values uh that we in our in our farm business that we've created and one of them is that we have no sales target in other words we don't assume well we made we made three million this year uh, next year we're going to make 3.5 million. Next year 4 million. Um, we we don't have that. We 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 don't assume that success is financially um, measurable. We measure success. There are other ways to measure success. Maybe sales don't go up, but maybe maybe. Um, Maybe nobody, maybe nobody on staff gets sick, gets sick this year, or nobody divorces this year, or nobody, you know, or or um, uh, no, nobody's teenager goes into the juvenile detention <laughs> program. You know, there there are other. You, are you with me? There are other goals. There are other objectives and goals that are bigger than just you know numerical sales targets, and. And so we find that that protects us. Now, does it mean that we don't care about? No, we, we obviously, we've got, you know, 20 paychecks to write. You know, we got, a, uh, we have people that depend on us. We have a team and, and, and we've got, a, you know, um, we can't go down and pay our taxes with good looks. So, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we do need to care about that. But when you start setting down what are our, what are our objectives and our goals, we find that if we put sales as as one of those goals then we then we quit looking at people as people and we begin looking at people as as are you in or out you know as possible possible uh, uh clients or patrons it cheapens it cheapens the way we view people um full stop now full stop that is so powerful when you start to track numbers in your business and look at sales then you start to treat the people who work for you as numbers rather than people did i get that right uh yes but even more so as as people out in the bigger universe everybody you encounter um because in, instead of thinking of people as just people let's have a relationship everything is kind of is kind of prejudiced by this are you going to buy from me or not if you're not going to buy from me what's your problem and and you should buy from me um it it it, it, it we find it jaundices our our outward view we can't just enjoy people now now they're notches in our belt or, or potential notches in our belt and i don't want to view the greater universe as are you a notch or not a notch i i, I don't want i don't want to cheapen my my initial thoughts about a person as to whether you're a notch for me or not like the guy yesterday for me was like, yeah. what are we talking yeah. about? Da, 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 yeah. Right? And it was like, I didn't that, disconnect. Yeah. yeah. I just that's a perfect learn. example. That's a perfect example. You're in you're intriguing. Wonder, no, I didn't even think about you being a, a sale. Uh, you're intriguing. You know, and that's that's and that's enough. That's enough. 
So, so anyway, we find that these, these 10 uh, values really help to protect us from what I call the, 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 the amoral Wall Streetification. And, and I'm not opposed to Wall Street. I'm just saying, I can tell you that the young people that come to us in their late 20s and 30s, and there are, like I say, we only take 10, but there are hundreds who, who in their answers to the application are clearly wanting to somehow disengage from, from a dehumanizing system, from an institutional dehumanizing, they're wanting to disengage that. They're already tired of it at 28, 29. They have master's degrees and they're tired of it. Somehow as a society, we need, we need to, to create, and again, I'm just, I'm just thinking out here. I don't, I don't have a, we need a better way to allow these folks with, with vocational, you know, Mike Rowe talks about dirty jobs, plumbers, electricians, uh, diesel mechanics. We need, we need a way to honor, to affirm the 40% of the population that doesn't aspire to sit in front of a Dilbert cubicle at the end of an expressway punching numbers in the cyberspace. And that's one of the reasons on our farm we promote the carbon economy, the composting, the the, the chips so much is is here we are. The West is burning up. You know we've got all this fire, we've got all this 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 uh, thing going on, and all that could that is all carbon that could be compostable. Eliminate the chemical fertilizer bill, so everything we spend in our country on chemical fertilizer could go into the carbon economy. We could actually build soil, have healthy earthworms, and employ thousands and thousands of five and six person crews out stewarding our woodland, stewarding our car, our biomass, integrating it with our food production, integrating with earthworms. And, and now mommy comes home, daddy comes home from work and little you know, Bonnie asks, what did you do all day? And they get to say, we created carbon and biomass legacy so you will inherit a better world than we inherited. Now suddenly you have nobility, you have sacredness, you have, I'm, I'm, I'm getting chill bumps uh, talking about it. Now, now you have vocational legacy and we desperately need that in our culture. You're, you're getting into something, Joel, that, and I have two questions that are burning at the same time. I'm going to ask them both. And one of them is there's a, there's two different paradigms right now. And I'm sort of stuck in between the two paradigms because I've got friends on both sides. One of them is, you know, we can't feed the world with meat growing, you know, with, with meat, we need to have synthetic meat, which is basically plant-based meat. And there's lots of, Seth Goldman is one of them at the forefront of it. Um, he's been out to your farm. I talked to him recently. One of his companies that he, I think, co-founded is Beyond Meat. Um, I actually did the whole Beyond Meat um, thing for about four weeks. It was not the right fit for me diet-wise. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't do that. It just energetically did not work well for my system. Um, I'm not against it, but I'm, I'm very curious about your... Um, your perspective on whether or not, so there's two pieces here. One is, can we do it? My guess is you're gonna say yes. So my second lead on question to that is, um, in a world that tends toward people not wanting to take responsibility and actually get out there and do the work, how do we feed the world the way that you're describing? And then one other question that's burning for me, uh, we kind of went off of this, but I'm going to come back to it and you don't have to come back to it right now. You can touch on it in a, in a few more minutes, but you talked about proving versus progress and progress toward a, a noble goal. This is one of my greatest heartaches, right? Um, in 20 years ago, when I first started this work, I was real clear. I was a bridge between people of different generations. It's very good at helping them to communicate and collaborate and strengthen engagement and collaboration across generations. And then I got really bored of that topic and have been for many years trying to figure out really what's the nut I'm trying to crack. And I don't think that that's something that you can force. I've tried it. Um, it's something that has slowly come to me. Like Yvette said, she saw on the side of a, of a, of a semi uh, tractor, she saw your success is our business. And she, the, the thought that came to her for me is your difficult conversations are my business. 
which is really what generational differences and facilitating difficult conversations were about for me. But I'm going to tell you right now that I don't have that. I don't have that clear, crisp, this is the noble goal I'm going toward. So I want to welcome a conversation with you about that for me, because I think maybe you'll have some ideas for me. And maybe we can come back to that, given that these two questions are very separate. Sure. All right. So, so let's... Um... Let's take the first one about you know can we feed the world? I mean, for, first of all, the um, you know the the, the plant based uh, you know the the fake the Beyond Meat the fake meat all that stuff um, that is that is not an actually a, a, an an environmentally uh, sustainable approach um, because when they say when they say for example let's take, take cows. Um, cows are not efficient the answer is yes they aren't the reason the, the reason that we have deep soils in the midwest of america is because the bison were not efficient they pooped out half of what they ate watermelons don't do that uh um you know soybeans don't do that corn doesn't do that and, and, and so so um if everything were as efficient as soybeans and corn and and lentils uh we wouldn't have any soil the only reason we have soil is because there are, are, are inefficient pruners on perennials, uh, which have a different energy flow, and that's probably more than we can get into this conversation. But 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 perennials versus annuals have a totally different energy flow, which makes a, a completely different soil building approach. Um, the the point is that uh, you know I mean if you, if you want to eat, you're right. There are a few people who seem to. Uh, you know, eat right for your type, right? There, um, that that seem to thrive on, you know, uh, a less meat. But most people um, thrive on at least some, if not a lot. And of course, then you have the whole carnivore, you know, the carnivore, and the and the the uh, other, um, uh, you know, pre prehistoric type uh, diets um, that are primarily all meat. And 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 of course. Uh, I'm sure you've heard plenty of wonderful stories of people that have been sick, 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 and they they went to a to an all meat thing, and suddenly they're you know really really well. So the fact is, we are different. We're 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 diverse. We're we're genetically diverse. We're um, uh, we're we're diverse, and so what works for one doesn't work for another, and that's why you know alternative medicine is is so demonized because you know acupuncture worked for me, but it didn't work for him, and and uh, you know. Uh, these are subtle things and and our our reduction our western linear reductionist uh science doesn't like um holistic uh nuanced kind of you know um mystic things um you know it it it, it wants a cut and dry you take this pill you have this effect and it happens every single time you know that that's what they want to see but we're, we're not every single time we're, we're not every single time people uh, you know, I, I, I could say one statement to you and you'll love it. And I could say the same statement to somebody over here and they'll be offended. Uh, you know, it, we're, we're, we're different. So, um, so, so can so we I, feed the world? I think what you're saying there is so very important and radical at the same time. It rolls off your lips like so easily, but I'm going to tell you the receiving side of that is not so easy because what goes on inside of me. And even when I was at your farm and I was like, you had Dr. Cohen there and Oh my God, this man was like irritated the banana. I mean, I was ready to punch him in the crotch or somewhere anyway. I mean, honestly, he bothered me because I didn't understand a single thing he said and he just confused me. And when I asked you like, what, what, did, what did you get out of that? And your answer to me was, what I learned in high school biology isn't the full picture. So like that for me was, that's who Joel Salatin is. Joel wants to be challenged. Joel doesn't believe there's one right answer. And so, but it challenged me because I want you, I'm going to be honest. I want you to tell me what to eat. I want you to tell me how to eat it, what time of day. To eat. I just want you to give me all the answers, right? I don't want to freaking think about it for myself or take the time to get inside my body and go, is this the right food for me? No, I just, in fact, part of me wants to just go pay that other doctor whose name is coming back to me. Um, the chiropractor doctor. Uh, Peter. Dr. Peter Osborne, I just want to pay you gazillions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Peter Osborne. Yeah, I, I'm with you, but but Misty, that's all a part of, of me 
putting my responsibility on somebody else. Uh, you know, we live in a time of we live in a time of coaching. Uh, everybody's got a they got a wellness coach, an investment coach, a recreation coach, a a, a career path coach. You know, we got all these coaches, and I, I think that's all a part. I, I, um, well, if I drill clear down to it, I think it's all a part of us being unable to discover who we really are. So when we don't discover who, what really floats my boat, what what's my soul in this, then, then we're we're um, we're we're not confident. We're not confident. If I'm not confident, what gets me up in the morning? Well, I'm not confident about what to eat. I'm not confident about where to go. I'm not confident about where to go on vacation. I'm not confident about where to put my money. I'm not confident about anything. Now, it doesn't mean that look, I'm not confident about everything, but but I think that I think that this um, confidence and affirmation kind of build on each other. And, and and when and when it breaks down in one area, it starts to break down another, including including embracing something. For example, for example, when we started uh, this farming many 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 years ago, ninety percent of our visitors were very um, liberal, environmental, gay, uh, hippie, dippy, you know, greeny. All right, and. And then the homeschooling movement hit. The homeschooling movement hit. The, the you know the conservative, the the you know, uh, many of the church people and conservatives. Man, we are not going to send our kids to that public school. We're going to homeschool. Well, guess what? They education is where the family like like set the final straw. Okay, we're gonna, we're going to change the educational environment for our kids. And the homeschooling movement just exploded around the country. Well, guess what? Within five years, we started seeing all these conservative homeschooling families coming to the farm. Why? Because they, they did one thing in their life that was unorthodox, unconventional, and they, they went against the grain on one thing and found it satisfying. And when they found that satisfying, they started saying, well, okay, well, what else have we just ignorantly or, 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 or conveniently embraced that's, that's conventional that isn't right? And so the next thing you know, they're planting a tomato plant, you know, on, on the patio. Next thing you know, they've got a little, you know, they've got a bag of oats and they're, and they're grinding, they've got a little grinder on the, on the kitchen counter and they're grinding flour and, 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 and now they've got a, a sourdough mother, you know, mother, a sourdough mother, uh, you know, brewing in the windowsill. And then there's a, a jar over here of alfalfa sprouts and mung bean sprouts and they're sprouting, you know, for the kids and the kids are eating, you know, salad instead of, you know, McDonald's. And you know what I'm saying? Th these things just domino when when you find a nugget that is that is different and is is uh, powerful, um, goodness! I I had a I had a dairy friend, dairy farming friend. He was he was burned out, tired. Three kids, they all hated the dairy, and we're we're getting out. At a function, he was talking to me about. It. I said, "Have you heard about these New Zealand little nipples? These these um, calf nipples." That the calves have to, they, they can't, they can't, you know, in other words, in dairy, you know, they take the calves away from the cows. So, they, so you know, so the farmer gets the milk and then they, they feed the calves either artificial or, you know, or, or tainted milk or something. Well, they, they have to feed them somehow. The calves, of course, are going to suck. And, and so, you know, uh, there's different kinds of, of bottles and sucking and, you know, mechanisms. Well, in New Zealand, in New Zealand, they figured out that, that the, that the calf, uh, actually doesn't want to hold their head up. They want to crook their neck because that sends the milk directly into their, into their uh, uh, second stomach and bypasses the first, makes it more assimilatable. And there's a whole cool thing. And, and you, you don't even have to wash it out. You know, you just, you, you have it in a barrel anyway. So <clears throat> he went home, he called this outfit. I gave him the phone number, called him, got this New Zealand set up, set it up in his in his, you know, where his calves were, where his calves were, and his wife, who was taking care of the baby calves, uh, and she was spending two hours a day washing all these little bottles for these calves, and they had, they had scours and different problems with the calves, always had vet bills and stuff. Suddenly, 
she had no washing so she 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 gave her two hours a day she they didn't have any sick calves no scours i saw them about I don't know, eight months later, she came running up to me, gave me this big bear hug, and said, you have changed our life, you know. Husband standing over here next to it, and he's watching, you know, this happen. He says, yeah, he said, so, so what's next? And within two years, he was fully organic, grass-based, no grain, and, 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 and had completely revolutionized his farm. And guess what? two of his three kids decided, I wanna come back to the farm. It completely changed the environment of the farm, the economics of the farm, the excitement of the farm, everything changed. And it started with one unusual, non-conventional approach that other farmers weren't doing. That, 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 uncon that, that, that one breakthrough, you know, can lead you to so many things. So, you know, it's a, it's interesting story, but, but but I hope it makes the point that that the that that one so many things don't work. I mean, how many people are going to their doctor and he's just switching pills, switching stuff, you know, and nothing works. They still have their aches, they still have their pain, they they still whatever have their problems, and um, and so you know, unconventional can really head you down a different path. I almost I almost hear in what you're saying that <clears throat> I almost hear there's this, it's not just the, the unconventional, here's what it is that I'm hearing. When confidence grows in one's ability to take care of themselves through uh, what, what comes to them. So I'll give you a real quick example uh, from me recently, then I'll tie it back to this. I woke up about eight weeks ago with my ear was numb, completely numb. And my intuition said, go to the acupuncturist. I'm not, I've never really had super good results from acupuncturists. So I was like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? And then my other thought was call the doctor. So I called the doctor. She said, go to the acupuncturist. The acupuncturist who was just kind of came to me said, go to your doctor. So I went to the acupuncturist. The next morning, my ear was completely with, with feeling. And for me, what that did was it built my confidence that- right. In my, in my, I want to say myself, but think like higher self. Think like yeah. I had my confidence that I know what I need. There's so much responsibility in that. Joel, real quickly, about two years ago, about a year, 2019, I went through a, a week long program in, um, in Arizona that was geared towards survivors. And the long story short of it is they take you through a whole uh, process where they empower you to become your own mom in that in your own your own internal parental uh unit becomes internal and not there's just so much uh, it just i grew up with a lot of uh, neglect and abuse and so i remember this the panic that came over me when i walked away from that experience and i went oh my god i'm responsible for myself like that mm -hmm. was overwhelming and scary for me and when I get scared, I can get scary. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I really, I can get really controlling and it's not fun. But what I've seen slowly over time since then is my confidence and my ability to, to be responsible for myself and to find my own answers has increased as yeah. I listen to that little voice that says, go to the acupuncturist, you know, go learn about how to, to do the, you know, the thing for the baby um, uh, for the baby, uh, uh, I want to say goats, but that's not what we're talking about. You're the baby cows, the calves. The baby calves, calves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hear like there's an increase. In, and so once you have a little increase in that confidence, yes. oh, okay, well yes. then it increased. It's almost like finding, this is going to sound so trivial, but it's not, it's almost like seeing the light and then the light just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we can see where to go. That's you say non-conventional, but really it's about there's a, there's, a, there's a group of people that are mostly business people who are trying to make a boatload of money. And so they're gonna use your fears to steer you one way or another. And also other fears around, I wanna be a good parent. I want, I wanna be seen as a good parent. If you do this, then I'm a good parent. These fears lead us toward, I wanna call it like a, a dark hole. Whereas mm -hmm. when we go toward the thing that is actually meant for us, it's maybe not 
maybe for some people and for me certainly it can be more scary but it is the light that i'm going toward that makes the light get brighter and brighter and brighter is that what basically i'm hearing you say yeah i i, I agree uh you know swimming upstream is not easy but but the more you the more you swim upstream yes absolutely the, the more confidence you have that it's the right direction um and and what's interesting is when when the culture finally realizes that you're that you're going the right direction and they turn around you're now in front you know when when, when you're when you're going uh the different direction and they turn you're now in front so, have you gotten uh, there yet joel with your farm have you gotten there yet oh no goodness we're you know we're still we're still way uh nobody very very few people um you know embrace what we're doing and i mean and especially in the neighborhood we have wonderful we have wonderful neighbors uh they're all great people i trust them with my with my uh, granddaughter i trust them with my bank account i just don't trust them with the land or my food <laughs> you know our farming neighbors so so here we are but um you know you wanted to you wanted to um, go somewhere. We, we, you want to talk about can we feed the world, and and so I'll just say, can we do it? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, with our with our management, uh, we right now average on our farm five times the county average of production in grass uh, per acre per acre. So, and we haven't bought a bag of chemical fertilizer or planted a seed in sixty years. And and you know when we came. Uh, in 1961, uh, the farm was a gullied rock pile. That's why Dad bought it. it. Was the cheapest. It was the cheapest place we could find, and um, and I remember I remember walking the whole place, and um, and never setting foot on a piece of vegetation. It was that barren. Uh, thistles, briars, brambles. You know, we could we could uh, feed about 15 cows. Um, that was it. And uh, now we have a hundred uh, fields that we used to make a hundred bales of hay on. Now we make. 1200 bales of hay on uh, this is not bragging misty this is simply paying homage and gratitude to to an amazing um an amazing design system that that really is abundant so many in 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 modern agriculture we have this idea that that nature nature is our enemy we've got to tame it we've got to wrestle with it. we've got to you know, we've got to wrestle with it and get it in some you know sort of half nelson right so i'm going to make you you know produce this do this blah 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 and and actually nature is not a reluctant partner uh, nature is a benevolent lover that just wants to be caressed in the right places and if if we can bring ourselves humbly to look at that pattern and that template to caress this this womb in 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 uh, in the right places the abundance is is beyond anything that we can imagine but instead we've we've created a dead zone the size of rhode island in the gulf of mexico we've doused it with chemicals we've killed the earthworms we've you know right now every every pound of grain costs us five pounds of soil think about that every pound of grain costs us five pounds of soil that includes the grain in your in your impossible burger and your fake meat okay so so uh, as you as you head down and you see the the civilizational legacy of assault and violence against against the earth that then translates into into our relational stuff i mean when when we when we don't ask how to make a pig happy or a chicken happy then as a society we're also not going to ask how to make Tom happy or Misty happy or Jane happy. We're not going to ask those questions. We're simply going to see them as inanimate piles of protoplasm to be manipulated, indoctrinated, and exploited to the greatest benefit of, of, of a few intellectual, you know, elites at the top of the of the heap, rather than a, a community of relationally complex symbiotic beings all with minds, all with thoughts, all with practical, visceral, uh, visceral responsibilities within our sphere of influence to touch, to move, to respond and bring, and bring um, the order, the order that comes from multiple counsel and multiple thoughts brings its own order to a place as opposed to the pseudo order 
that comes from a top-down centralized uh, manipulative interventionist uh, process. You know, you, you say it with such ease and such grace, Joel, you always do. And for many people and those who are listening in and many people I've had the privilege of working with, the, the humility that you've gone through that life has offered to you to help you to see how, and there's a, there's a quote that comes to mind that I hear a lot from one of my mentors. And what she says to me is, Misty, nobody does better by being made to feel worse. And she said that to me because I was beating myself up. Uh -huh. Right. And, uh -huh. and that reminds me. So I don't do better by being made to feel worse. And it reminds me of what you just said there makes me think of we have most people, I think a large percentage of people see other people and see the world as something that they have to control and manipulate. And that feeds the ego that somehow we're in control. But what you're talking about is the assumption that people are good and they want to do well. I heard you say people don't want to just sit around on their butts all day long. They want to do right. something that's meaningful. And the, the earth, by the way, also wants to, to heal. It wants people and the earth <clears throat> and animals. We all want to heal. We want to to, to, yeah. to be well. And so the key in leadership, be it leading a farm, be it leading other people, um, leading animals, is to figure out what does that one need to thrive rather than yeah. trying to tell yeah. it what to do and how to do, to do it. Exactly. Uh, well said. It, it's creating a, a habitat that allows each of the beings within its purview to achieve their full, uh, their full physiological um, uh, expression uh, of, 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 their, of their identity. If it's an oak tree, how can I make a habitat that allows this oak tree to, to be its most oak treeness, you know, uh, and, and the cow and, and the tomato and the whatever. And we don't think like that. that that's a very almost a, an Eastern way. It's, it's an Eastern way rather than a Western way of thinking. And, and, and so I actually, uh, this is kind of another uh, uh, big topic, but uh, you know, I grew up pretty much in the Western mindset. You know, it's a very mechanical, uh, uh, you know, systematic, uh, reductionist, linear kind of thinking. And I've spent my life trying to embrace the Eastern idea that, that, it, that we're all related. It's complex. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's more than me. It's more than me. It's a community. And so I've had to de-learn a lot of that Greco-Roman, uh, you know, Western uh, uh, stuff. And, and, and what, what I see is a value. I mean, if we were all Eastern and still just sitting here in awe of the moon, we probably wouldn't have invented the light bulb, you know? So, so there, there's actually, there's a, both things come to it. And so the problem is when, when the Western view comes without recognizing the, the, the value of a happy pig, then you simply have a complete amoral, um, certainly amoral, some would say immoral, but, but certainly amoral view uh, 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 of your experiments. Um, I mean, right now, for example, we've got land grant colleges doing experiments on pigs, trying to isolate the porcine stress gene so they can pull, strip that out of the DNA and we can abuse pigs more, but they won't be stressed about it. You know, uh, ha, ha, a society that does that, what do you, how do you think to, to, to the least of these, a society that does that to the least of these, how are they going to treat the greatest of these? You know, Misty and Yvette and, 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 you know, and, and others in society, how are we going to view each other? And so, so how we, how we view and, and create a habitat to allow the full expression of pigness and tomatoness and oak treeness creates a, 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 an environment, a habitat that, that determines how we're going to allow ethnicity, cultural differences, religious differences, how we're going to have a culture that embraces those diverse expressions of, of, of thought. You, you can't have one without the other. You, you, and, and, and if you have one, it necessarily impacts the other. And, and so they actually synergize symbiotically into a, a better whole. Yeah, it's not even just embrace. If I might add to that, it's not just embrace, it's celebrate. It's celebrate. 
it's celebrate yeah. all those differences because those differences added together, man, they make the world delicious. And they, I, you know, a lot of people listening in are going to be focused on the bottom line. And it, I, I got to say that people from a variety of backgrounds, they bring the best ideas if, if there's a safe environment for total expression of that. And the key, I think, is creating that safe environment for the expression of that, which is what you talk about, I think, when you talk about stewardship. And that just actually touched on my question that I asked you, which is prove versus progress. And my goal, my noble or important goal, I would say in this moment is to create those safe spaces for, for the fullest expression of, of, of greatness is what I like to say, but really what does that mean? Potential, really what does that mean? It means that people have a chance to, to, to offer the gifts that have been given to them. And from that comes so much good both for the bottom line as well as for people's lives. They're happier. You talk about 80% of Americans hate their jobs. Yeah, they do. They do hate their jobs. And they're starting to see, their eyeballs are starting to open up that they can do other things and that they don't have to hate their jobs. What are companies going to do when that happens? Oh, well, they're going to have to try to figure out a way to create a safe space for people to live their lives, to not just be a, a cog in the wheel that makes them money, but to see them as human beings that matter. Right. You know, as a perfect example of that, uh, uh, Misty, we're actually wrestling with, with two, two very practical uh, views of that. Uh, for example, as you and I are talking right now, my, my, the, the stewards and the, the team is out here uh, processing chickens. OK, they're processing chickens out here in, in the open uh, shed. But you know what? Um, yesterday they were involved with uh, uh, they, they put up a corral at one of the farms. They sorted some cows off. One of them went over and helped a, a heifer that was having trouble getting her calf blended on, helped the calf. My point is that, that, that we only do this a couple of days a week. And, and in, the, in the processing industry, these mega centralized, you know, 4,000 employee um, abattoirs, slaughterhouses, um, the average person can learn their job in 20 minutes. How would you like to spend your life doing a job that it took you 20 minutes to learn? And, and it, it's rote. It's the same thing. They get tarpal, carpal tunnel syndrome, repetitive motion disease, and, and of course, uh, uh, um, just, just emotional, just, you know, you can't imagine um, that. And they're in there in blood and guts and butchering and killing animals every day. Goodness, even in the, in the Bible, the Levites who ran the temple, uh, that was basically a slaughterhouse, the temple, you know, they, they had all these sacrifices and they drew straws and only pulled one month since recognizing that it's not emotionally healthy to kill animals every day. You've got to, you've got to grow animals too. And, and interestingly, all these animal welfare things that sound so great, these animal welfare rules, they never say a word about the human welfare in these big plants. We desperately need a, 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 an animal processing paradigm that allows people to process a couple, three days a week. And there's been a couple, three days a week growing the animals or, or, you know, having fun with, you know, doing something that that's living with the animals, not just death with the animals. And, and, and so, so that that's one element. Another element is, so we're starting to think I've wanted a diner. I want a diner for so long, but I just get, I just get stuck on, on, I mean, we service all these restaurants and we service a lot of chefs and, and they burn out, you know, they burn out at 40. They just, they just get tired of the, of the late nights, the grind and all that stuff. And, and so we're sitting here thinking, well, there is, is a, is, is, is a factory, is a factory food service. Um, what if those people, so, so we're now thinking, all right, if we had a, if we had a polyface diner, what would it look like? And just yesterday, literally, this is cutting edge. Just yesterday, we we brainstormed the idea: what if we, instead of trying to find a, a, a team that would do a diner, what if we simply take our staff here at, at the farm and rotate them in in one week one week cycles through the diner, and so you get to grow the chicks in the field, and then a day a week you process chicks and, and then you have another week to sell uh, barbecued chicken to customers and, and you cycle through. So you have a very eclectic, uh, broad, you see what I'm saying? I'm you, so you, excited. You, 
Yeah, you, 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 you use different muscles, you use different uh, thoughts, you've got different problem solving. And what you do is create an excitement and an enthusiasm to embrace every morning because it's presenting a, a, a new opportunity to serve within this greater context of healing. And you're not just doing one little segregated specialized uh, thing, you're actually part of a, of a greater organism that 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 you can contribute multiple ways your hands your feet your your mind uh and and your whole being is being exercised with different projects at different times in different contexts that's really cool that is really cool it's so special i'm so excited to eat at this diner i can already see it and because I'm seeing literally my weight, my, my the wait staff coming up and having questions, which I've always got a gazillion questions about the food, and they're right. going to have all the answers and the excitement oh, exactly. about it. Which gonna, yeah, yeah, I can't wait. That Joe, we're coming to the end of our time together. I I feel like I could spend a lot more. Maybe we need to do another one. I, I definitely uh, I love to conversate with you. It's a gift. I do feel like I belong with you and alongside you in this journey of healing ourselves, the planet and animals and all the rest of that stuff. I wanted to tell you one last little thing is I know you're doing events six this year out at your farm. And I went to one of them and it was extraordinary. I know you got another one coming up in August. I want you to know it would be an honor and a privilege to MC, to facilitate, to moderate any of these events. So I'm here. You you let me know, and I would love to come do that. Thank you. Well, that's that's very kind. Uh, they're all very you know very different kinds of things. Uh, we're calling them gatherings, not events, because that's we, what I we, meant to we, say. Thank you. Yeah, we, we want we want to create this persona that that I'm not going to somebody else's thing. I'm being gathered to my thing. That that's a real different idea uh that, that that that's inclusive that's i i'm a part of this so we we've been very intentional about using the term gathering and not event or shindig or conference or, or that which all which all denote some somebody else has done everything and i'm just coming to enjoy no you are part of the flock you're part of the herd gathering together to participate in this in this thing and and we just we just like the inclusivity of that kind of terminology. So yeah, we we are very specific about how we you know pick language. These, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I gotta tell you, I really love that. And given coming out of COVID and so many people being you know isolated for so long, I I think that right now is it is the time. I think businesses that thrive. And I mean, I, I believe in businesses thriving. Businesses yeah. that, that are going to thrive are going to be the ones that know how to create that belonging that know how to create that community. I know myself, I am craving that. I get that when I connect with you. And yeah. companies and organizations and leaders that create that belonging, that's where people are going to want to flock because you know what matters to you, you know what you stand for and i believe in what you believe in i think that right now is a time for for leaders who know what they believe in to stand up more to share it more mm -hmm. to bring people together around that thing that they believe in which is what you do joel thank you for this time together it's been a real gift to me and everybody who had a chance to listen in. If you wanna know more about how to gain access to the products that, and also the services that Polyface offers, meaning you wanna create a gathering there, it's all outdoors, it's beautiful. I was there in very comfortable place outside to under the shade to sit in and also great food to enjoy while you're there. Definitely reach out to Polyface Farms for that. But also if you go to Polyface Yum, Y-U-M, Polyface Yum, you can you can order food from them. And if you're close enough to Polyface, I don't know, is that 500, I don't know how many miles from the farm that you go, but you, you guys do drop offs. And I believe you actually also ship your meat. So that's, yeah, it's real, um, a real gift to the world to be able to experience your food. And it's very different. Um, some people like wanna know, I get a lot of questions. Is it, is the food actually, does it taste different? It tastes very different and you have to prepare it differently. And, um, and it's delicious and I'm so thankful for it. So. Thank you, Misty. 
thank you. That's very kind. It's been an honor and a delight to be with you. And I look forward to our next, our next uh, interactions. <laughs>